Welcome, everyone. You're listening to A Therapist, a Buddhist, and You, brought to you by the Recovery Collective in Annapolis, Maryland. Today's episode is a must listen for anyone in recovery, concerned family members, and even professionals. The MVP of this podcast is all, and myself, are going to delve into the topic of how people set themselves up for drug and alcohol cravings. How does that sound, Zal? That sounds very useful. I think so. It's We're certainly in a time of year when there's traditions, there's holidays, we've got Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, and I'm probably forgetting one or two other ones that are coming up in the next month or two. And it's just a time of, sure, traditions and, and good spirit, but this is often a time with, here in the East Coast, it gets dark quick and a lot of other things come up that tends to lead to cravings for a lot of people. So I figured it was a good time for us to hit this topic. Mm -hmm. Makes sense? Yeah. It's a very familiar word for me, <laughs> craving, because mm. that's the concept in Buddhism too, to na. That is a thing, a, a human thing, isn't it? To mm. crave, to have that, want that satiated. Well, let's kick things off by understanding what cravings really are and why they play such a crucial role in addiction recovery. When we crave drugs and alcohol, we are in a state of anticipation we want to use. And this can be caused by, of course, withdrawal, or it can be a response to certain stimuli, like being surrounded by people who are drinking, or a fond memory where using was involved. So when we crave, the effects of our bodies can be variable or even contradictory. Some may experience heightened arousal, may salivate, while others experience depressed heart rates. The point is, cravings are highly subjective. And we have to learn the things that trigger our cravings and create a plan to curb them. Ultimately, cravings are not your fault, but some are. You agree with that? Yeah. Taking responsibility for mm -hmm. what we have control over. Yeah. it's. I like to say that I might not be, I am out of control or powerless over my first thought my first emotion, my first feeling, but I'm not powerless over that second thought, that second emotion. And we may have a fleeting thought or, or a fleeting craving, but I'm, I am responsible for potentially setting up the conditions for cravings or how I react to that first thought or emotion. Mm -hmm. So if you want to really look at and understand the physiological aspects and among other things, please check out episode three and four. I'll put them in the uh, the notes. But the episode titles, Uncovering the Truth About Addiction, The Solution to Recovery, and episode four, The Science Behind Addiction, Debunking Myths and Exploring Reality, do a real good job understanding addiction, not just as an addict or an alcoholic or someone in recovery, but for family members to just to understand how the addiction works, both scientifically and just addictively. <laughs> so go feel free to check them out. So we're not going to do a whole lot of understanding the science and, and how it relates to the individual or the family member, but we're going to take the, the healthy form of control and, and look at really how people set themselves up for cravings and how they can turn that around. Mm. So let's break that down, shall we? Sounds good. We are going to look at these cravings and how we set them up biopsychosocially, meaning other ways, say that what they, people do physically, mentally, emotionally, and through behaviors that lead to cravings, including the social environmental aspects, okay? I believe cravings are not just fleeting desires. I think when I talk to people, I ask them, hey, is this a fleeting thought? And that can be a passing by thought of a memory or having a fleeting thought of using, but it not being the way I explain it, like a full-blown thirst or want to use, whether it's physical or mentally. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. not just the fleeting thoughts, fleeting thoughts are fleeting thoughts. That can be for food. That can be for sex. That can be for um, drugs and cravings that way. So we're going not just through the fleeting desires, but cravings are an intricate manifestation that deeply rooted in this biopsychosocial framework. Picture it like a puzzle. And when we're putting these pieces together to understand why cravings become such a pivotal challenge in the recovery process. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the first category. When we say biologically, we often think, well, how do we set ourselves up 
for cravings physically. I think one thing that often comes to mind for most people is, well, withdrawal. (laughs) So if your body is wanting substances and you're feeling flu-like symptoms or worse, your body and your mind is going to say, I want to feel better. (laughs) And a craving is one way to alleviate that discomfort. So I think that's an obvious one that Mm. withdrawal is one way we set ourselves up for cravings. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. But you're saying there's more to it. Let's do it. Mm. That's a no-brainer one. How about consuming sugar? What happens when uh, we eat a lot of sugar, when we consume sugar, whether it's through food or sodas and liquids? You get a peak, right? Mm -hmm. This can lead to a temporary high. And then after that high, what happens? A subsequent crash. When we use drugs and alcohol, what happened? You peak, Mm -hmm. you fork, and then eventually crash. This is partially when it comes to sugar due to blood sugar levels, and it releases certain neurotransmitters. So let's look at the initial high. When you consume sugary foods and beverages, they rapidly broken down into glucose, sugar, and a digestive system. Enters the bloodstream, causing a quick spike in blood sugar levels. When the blood sugar goes up, Just like when you drink, when you do cocaine, it releases serotonin and dopamine. So when you get that sugar high, it is very relatable (laughs) to a drug high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm interpreting everything that I'm hearing from my own experience and also from some Buddhist principles as well. And what I'm seeing is this idea of... um, we're always looking for ease and comfort, whether we know it or not. Mm. And there's something very comforting about familiar things that has already happened. And there's no problem with that. But when it comes to addiction, for me to do the same thing, I have to do more to get the same effect. You know, yeah. So that's where this becomes problematic. Yeah. Uh, so like when you're talking about the crash from sugar, you know, that's so because, again, an addict's mind is self-deceptive. You know? And I don't think before making a decision... I think after I made a decision right? in yeah. retrospect. So these are really important um, tools or things that you're bringing up mm-hmm. to realize that, okay, what is it? How am I setting up to be in this yeah. situation so that I don't get into it? <laughs> it was amazing. I used to run a 8 a.m. morning process meeting at an inpatient. And well, what happens with people that are chronically using substances? They've been using the night before and then, yeah, they might be going into withdrawal, but they're certainly not at the high that, that they were. There was a crash. And a lot of times when it comes to physical or even psychological dependence, well, I don't want to feel that crash. <laughs> so just like sugar, where the levels are in decline and the insulin levels and the glucose, well, that's associated with fatigue, irritability, low mood. So what do people want to, want to do? Well, I want to feel better. I want to get that boost. It was amazing to me. I remember looking around. There's 20, 30 people in this the morning group. And I couldn't tell you how many lollipops <laughs> at 8 a.m. in the morning and candy bars and chocolate milk. And I'm looking around and I'm like, why are we as a facility – encouraging these people to continue this cycle of, okay, I'm sluggish. I'm not feeling good. Well, I've conditioned myself to try to get, whether it's a a high or a boost in an unhealthy way. So it was a very similar pattern that people were used to. Let's be honest, a lot of 12 step meetings, what do we see? Yeah, coffee, but Oreos and and candy and and cookies and stuff like that. Well, we may not be drinking or, or using substances, but hey, there's that little sugar boost that we can we can take. So, is it lesser of two evils? Of course. Do I think this is the number one offender to get people to relapse? Well, it's certainly not helping. It's creating this cycle that we're used to. So, as a as a clinical director, I'm like, why are we giving all these these people, this sugar, like we're trying to help them regulate their blood sugar levels and not be on this peak and crash thing that they're used to. 
this is a, a big one for a lot of people that it's a it's a freebie. It's a it's a little boost, even though it comes with a crash. Hey listeners, we've got something extraordinary to share, a chance to reshape your journey no matter where you are. You're familiar with Zal Mall's insights on our podcast, but there's more. Through the Recovery Collective, he offers life, mindfulness, recovery coaching, and meditation groups guiding you toward a fulfilled and mindful existence, no matter your location. Zal's journey from a Burmese Buddhist novice to a skilled practitioner equips him with timeless wisdom and contemporary strategies. Whether you're navigating life's shifts, seeking clarity, or pursuing self-awareness, Zal's coaching serves as a compass guiding you toward success. The best part? Zal's approach centers on your growth and empowerment. He equips you with tools to tap into your inner strengths for continuous evolution no matter where you are. Ready to take that next step in your personal growth journey? Connect with Zal Ma and the Recovery Collective at 240-813-8135 from anywhere in the world. Investigating in your journey reaps immeasurable rewards. Let Zal Ma guide you toward resilience, clarity, and empowerment no matter where life finds you. Now, let's transition back into our conversation. Stay tuned, stay curious, and keep your journey growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I also interpret what I'm hearing from the point of view of mindfulness as well, that there is a power in the awareness. So it's better to become aware when I'm in that state of craving than not, you know, because it prompts me, especially if I want to be sober and if I want the solution, it prompts me to, okay, how do I get out of it or at least accept that, okay, this is what's happening. And also um, something, I guess the translation is attachment. There's also something that is translated as like some kind of hooking. It's hard to unhook. Like that's how I feel about craving. Once it clicks in, it's like a hook is already hooked in. And and uh, from a Abhidhamma point of view, which is a Buddhist uh, psychology, there's an input and the sense. So when the input comes in, we know what it is. But the interesting thing about the mind, since we're talking about conditioning too, is that sometimes our brain or our internal sense knows what it's looking for, like choosing what's there and then picking up what it's looking for instead of what's actually there. You shared two things at the beginning that we're we're often searching for relief. What was the other one? Ease and comfort. Ease and comfort. I think the other thing that we often search for is an energy boost, (laughs) Mm -hmm. whether it's because our mood isn't where we want it to be or we're down, whether it's depression, sadness, a different level of discomfort. And through substance use, we can change our mood quickly and boost it. We are used to whether it's ease or discomfort or pleasure. Mm -hmm. That's the other piece. One quick way to do that is with food and beverages like caffeine and certainly sugar. So this is a, a condition response with hey, if I consume this, then I can get maintain my energy or, or my mood quickly, even though it's a quick return in a, a crash. But mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine looking around at 8 a.m. and like, what are you guys doing eating, <laughs> eating lollipops at 8 a.m.? What are we doing? <laughs> so that was that was a big one. And mm-hmm. I laugh as you know, our kids are young, but I, like as a parent – with kids that are trick or treating, that is like the equivalent an adolescent or you know a child's version of a hangover. They're up late, they're getting sugar, and then they crash, and then they have to wake up for school, and they're irritable and they're tired, but they also got the these blood glucose levels are out of whack too, and it's like the closest thing to a hangover for a mm-hmm. <laughs> for a child that doesn't drink. Yeah, so that's biological. Yeah. It also makes me think about what I usually hear about halt, right, in 12-step meetings. Good. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, which I think can affect the biological aspect too, right? Hugely, hugely. And and I think halt covers biological in terms of either hunger. I mean, look at those. It's wonderful marketing, those Snicker commercials. Or was it Twix? I can't remember which one it is. And the someone's irritable are going to go off into someone, and then all of a sudden... They say something bad, but then they eat a uh, Snickers and then instantly they're not an asshole to the person anymore. 
like grab a Snickers. You know, it's the, hey, if you're irritable or whatever, eat this sugar-filled snack to <laughs> elevate your mood instead of walnuts and apple, you know, healthy carrots or whatever. But it's beautiful marketing. It's, mm -hmm. hey, if you're irritable, get a spike. Pretty smart of them. So that's the, the physiological or the hungry part of it. Yes, because what happens when you're hungry? Your blood sugar levels drop, which can lead to you know, insulin levels and irritability. So as opposed to a spike, here's a drop. Um, we'll hit the other four, angry, lonely, tired, and the other one. Yeah. So we'll keep going. Sounds good. Yeah. Talking about the biological part of how we set ourselves up for cravings. What you ingest, what you put in your body, food and beverages can certainly do that. Now, it's uh, we're just getting out of fall soon here and getting into winter and, and uh, certainly colds and our rampant where we are, COVID still going on, children are bringing home every kind of sickness from schools and at any level. And when we're sick, we often cough. And when we cough, it might be hard to sleep and things like that. So what do we know about some cough syrups? I mean, there's some alcohol in some of them. Some of them have alcohol in it. Same thing with mouthwash. So I, I ask people listening, whether it's you, the person yourself that you're in recovery or a family member or loved one. And I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, and I want you to think about this as I ask Zal this, and I'll try to say it slow. How much alcohol does it take for an alcoholic to drink alcoholically? So for an alcoholic, how much does that person have to ingest for it to react alcoholically? That's like a rhetorical question for an alcoholic. <laughs> okay. So whether it's, is it a, is it a beer? Is it a shot? Is it a drop? Is it, you see my point? Yes. But because we don't know why the hell would we risk it? Mm -hmm. But that is often what we do. Or some people, I've had people that this has been their relapse pattern. That they they didn't they either went to the uh, grocery store or their or their significant other did, and then they got that mouthwash and they look and says ah, it says alcohol right on the the bottle. Right? And the person looks at it and goes, shit, well, I'm not going to swallow it, so I'll be all right. And they mouthwash it, and it burns a little, and they do all that, and they spit it out. And then do they necessarily have a craving right away? I'll say most likely not for, for a lot of people. But every time I've, I've had someone come to me and say, I've relapsed and I have no idea why, there's been multiple things that we can look at biologically, psychologically, emotionally, socially, and even spiritually that go, oh, here are the things, not just one, but, but multiple things that has led to your relapse. And, and we can look at the anatomy and break it down. And for one gentleman, it took him two weeks of mouthwash before he realized he started getting cravings. And after looking at all these variables and things and other things happen that we'll probably talk about later in, in, in this episode or the next, that he goes, man, it might have started with that mouthwash. Because is it touching his tongue? Is he accidentally swallowing some? Yeah, absolutely. Here's another question. People like to cook with alcohol. Scientifically, it's in the acidic. It's, an, it's a tasty acidic that changes the complex flavors of food, which is valuable for cooking. So one question I often ask people, well, you go to a restaurant and you say, uh, ah, man, I really want this pasta dish or this meat dish and the sauce has wine in it. So sometimes you may ask, hey, can you cook this dish? Can the chef not use any wine? And what's the first thing people often say? Ah, the wine is cooked out. Now, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of chefs and cooks in, in recovery. <laughs> and yeah, maybe if it's to order and all that, but if I'm a cook, 
I'm not going to care if that alcohol gets to the, the temperature and the time it needs for all that alcohol to burn off because alcohol and wine only makes food taste better. Mm. I am not willing to risk my sobriety on someone else. Now, let's say it even cooks off all the way. Let's say it burns all the way off and there's no more alcohol in the sauce, but the flavor is. Huh. Flavor. <laughs> That's one of the senses, right? Now, I'm tasting alcohol. What other drug do we do that we no longer do that we accept to allow one of our senses to, to ride with it? Do we all of a sudden like, man, my drug of choice was cocaine and let me chop up Tic Tacs or Tums and let me snort it? <laughs> That's insane. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we don't want to activate the physical sensation, the smell. If someone does heroin, we're not going to all of a sudden syringe puddle water and shoot it in our, in our veins. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't do that. So why do we potentially set ourselves up for a craving with alcohol. If this is life and death for you, why risk it? Why risk tasting the, we're in Maryland crabs with beer in it? Hey, I just don't want it with beer. You don't need to boil it with beer, put vinegar in it and do whatever. It's my point is why risk your sobriety on the taste? If you're not getting the effect thoughts on that mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's actually very humbling uh to know that and also from my own experience too is that the reason why i don't drink is not really a moral issue because it's a liability that once i start i cannot stop yeah. so like i don't want to risk it right it's not because i'm against it and you know i don't need to like go live in the forest or live in the monastery and like eliminate alcohol 100 percent out of sure. my life but there is something very respectful about doing my part. Mm. So like, but if I risk myself into this kind of situation and if I relapse, then like my side of the street is not really clean, but I can take all the precaution and then set the condition yeah. and then do it that way. And also the thing about the craving that you're talking about, there's also a sense of pull, right? Mm. I, I mean, I might not be aware of the body taking it, but then throughout the day, I'll be like, attract it like i'll be pulled towards mm -hmm. all those and i'm like what's happening you know i'm sober <laughs> right yeah. there is also that contradiction within uh because yeah that the physical part of the body and you know the the phenomena yeah. of craving once it kicks in yeah you know it's hard to get out <laughs> yeah the phenomena of craving is another way to say the obsession of the mind allergy of the body mm -hmm. at some point the brain of an alcoholic and addict which you can check episode three and four for how and why that works is that there is an obsession, a desire, even though there's an abnormal reaction to the body an allergy. So even though adverse negative things happen, somehow the mind and the body goes, I want this, I need this. So if that happens, even without the taste of alcohol, why would you... <laughs> Set that you set, set yourself up with a potential craving. So, get non-alcoholic cough syrup. Get non-alcoholic mouthwash. Other cough syrups have things like codeine. Mm. So, codeine or DXM can be potential triggers for individuals in recovery because it's opiates, right? Codeine mm. is an opioid, and DXM is a dissociative drug with some similarities to opioids in higher doses, but that can be a danger for a lot of people, a lot of people. So it's, what am I willing to do to protect my sobriety? And I happily buy non-alcoholic mouthwash. <laughs> I happily can, and a lot of chefs said, yeah, the wine is great, but you can use anything acidic to replace wine for the meals. Mm -hmm. That's great. So far, so good, right? Yeah, so far, so good. I feel like we're unpacking, or you're unpacking the craving very well, and um, it's really good. The other thing that I think of is craving is like the opposite of spiritual fitness, right? Hmm. Like once that, again, that hook, the attachment, once it's clicked, 
Like I'm not present anymore. All my senses are so consumed by it. And it is as if I've already done it, right? That's also yeah. another powerful thing about craving. And in that, uh, you know, 12-step literature, it talks about there's no first offense. Yes. So like once I get in there, there's no way of getting back out. Yeah. And it's so isolated. That's all I can think about, yeah. you know? I remember, I remember her very well. And she got a lot of time in sobriety. And I remember her saying, I can't fathom not having my grandmother's pasta la vodka. <laughs> Because it's a pasta sauce and had vodka in it and things like that. And it's like, and it was a great group discussion. Okay. One aspect is what length are you willing to go? Okay. You can make it this, this weighted pasta la vodka recovery. How much, what is your risk reward for that? Some people choose to not worry about wine and their sauces and food, especially for people in early recovery. Why would you even consider that, let alone for, for many years for a lot of people? Mm. It says, what length are we willing to go that we actually have control over to minimize risk or not set ourselves up for a craving? Yeah. And this is one where I don't know the statistical numbers, but I always felt comfortable saying if you're in the room full of 20 to 30 people, that there's going to be multiple people that are going to be in this exact situation whether you're an addict or an alcoholic or not. In a room full of 20, 30 people, there's going to be multiple people that are going to be in a situation where there's a catastrophic accident or a planned surgery and or repair that can lead to what? Pain pills. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So this is a big situation that I... Let's do a couple scenarios. Let's say your drug of choice is... Oxycontin or heroin, right? And you've gotten to a point that if you ever consume it again, you know you're going to have that obsession and you're going to be off to the races. So here's a hypothetical. Let's say you throw your back out and you've got back spasms and you can't move it and you're in pain and you go to the doctors and they're willing to give you a narcotic for it. What would you do, Zal? What would you do? I'll have to disclose that I'm an addict. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and choose other options. Okay. Seems like a no-brainer. Let me give you another example. So I worked at more than one facility, and this facility that I treatment facility that I used to work with was part of a hospital. So it wasn't on the main campus of the hospital, but this hospital owned this uh, inpatient, now patient facility. There is this lady that had gigantic like a club hand from injection and it was infected and it was very painful her drug of choice was heroin and she was in a lot of pain but she was very fearful and she said i don't want narcotics i do not want i don't want opiates for my hand totally understand she's still an inpatient but we have to get her hand checked out i drove with her to the emergency room, the nurse is called over. Hey, we're bringing Luke and the client. Da da da. Just sure, no problem. We get there, get checked in, and the hand was bad. It was the size of a softball, really painful. And she said she didn't want any opiates. And guess what the doctor said? Well, you have to have them. Mm. So you can imagine what I did. I looked at her, and she gave me the okay. She was scared to death. And luckily I was there. Mm. And then she looked at me and I said, you good? Uh-huh. And I looked at the doctor and I said, what the fuck is wrong with you? She mm. is in an inpatient for opiates and she said she doesn't want a narcotic and you say she has to? What the hell's wrong with you? Mm. The doctor was shook. Now this was probably eight years ago, 10 years ago, probably longer than that now. But how could this doctor... <laughs> She had support. Mm. Can you imagine when you're in pain and the thing that you want least in life is to no longer be suffering and in pain and you tell a doctor that, please, I'm an addict, I'm an alcoholic, give me something in narcotics. And the first thing they say is, okay. Now, if I wasn't there, she and I both know she would have said, okay, 
Yeah. You gave me permission. So if you ever are in this situation, if you're ever in this situation, go with support. I had a sponsor of mine threw his back out. So we went to the, the docs and I uh, looked at him and he could have a whole lot of narcotics with his muscle spasms. He literally couldn't straighten his back. Luckily I was there and he says, I don't want any narcotics. So we gave him a muscle relaxer. If I wasn't there, it could have been easier for his, his addictive brain or, or not wanting to suffer. Hey, I know what really works for this, but having an advocate and a support for these situations is really important. Really important. Yeah. Yeah. These are all good stuff. And, um, I don't know if this is like kind of too much for somebody who's new to recovery, but those cravings really lessen over time. And that's been an essence of recovery for me too, which I always look forward to now mm -hmm. that recovery or sobriety is not about as people know already who are in the, recovery process is that it's not about abstaining, right? It's yeah. not just about not just doing, right? Otherwise, it's just a ticking bomb. It's going to come yes. back, you know? So there's a lot of emphasis on the character development, mm -hmm. right? Like, what is it that's going to make my life more meaningful? And I'm just being doing, doing, I'm just busy doing those things. And then the craving has less control, you know? Yeah. For me, that's like a setup for success for, uh, you know, long-term sobriety. Yeah. To be chasing after things that makes life meaningful. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll go over in a, a quick sec at uh, very soon potential ways to deal with pain or surgeries that are not narcotics, but I'll give you one more example. Now I worked with a guy that had old school NA guy, um, had when I worked with him, you know, 15, 20 years of sobriety. And uh, he was one of those guys that no matter whatever happens to me, I'm never taking a narcotic. And so much so in recovery, he got one of those really long nails, penny nails, boom, went right in his eye. He pulled the nail out of his eyeball, drove himself to the emergency room. And he says, I need to see, see someone. I need to see someone. <laughs> and the person said, oh, please take a seat. And he says, I got a nail go through my eyeball. I didn't. And then he's like, yeah, come wait with me right now. Right? Imagine the excruciating pain. And he didn't take any narcotics during that whole time. I don't think I could do that. <laughs> Meaning whether it was my drug of choice or not, there might be a position where I am on opiates and narcotic medications. Whether I get an accident or a surgery, I don't know if I have that ability. Now, I would hope that I would have people help me decide if that's true, if at all possible, or it happened and I'm on a morphine drip or whatever. Okay. So let's do that hypothetical. You're on narcotics, you got out of surgery, you got a rod in your leg, whatever it is, and now you're on narcotics. You're on uh, a medication that is your drug of choice or it could trigger you or you could become addicted to it. What do we do? This is important. One, one question I always ask people, it's, is this a relapse or not? I don't think it is. Meaning if you have your support, your recovery network, it's deemed appropriate, healthy, essential. Right now, it's not a relapse. That's my personal opinion without all the context based on what people are thinking. In general, I don't think that's a relapse. Now, what you do here on out is vitally important. So one thing I always recommend, if you have a planned surgery, you talk to the doctors, um, an addict, I abuse substances, especially opiates or I don't want to take it, I don't want to abuse it, but you have to, or it's, it's deemed appropriate. My recommendation is, okay, you give me a script for one, two, three days before you see me again post-op. Because that means here's the medication, it'll get me through, I see the doctor again. Narcotic pain medication at one time was giving to minimize the pain, make the pain bearable not alleviate it. Mm -hmm. How is it prescribed now? To not only get rid of the pain, but feel good while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. That's how it's given now. But medication was initially to make the pain bearable. That would be my recommendation. I don't have to feel nothing for three days, but I'd like to make it bearable till I see you again. That'd be my first recommendation. Second recommendation would be to tell 
as much people as possible in your recovery network. Why? It goes back to whether I relapse or not, or whether I'm living in the addiction or not, is determined by how much am I hiding isolation. Absolutely. So that's, I mean, in terms of terms that they say it's taking the will back or running the show, yeah. right? So when you're sharing and being open, you're more like, what should I do? As opposed to, I know what to do. Absolutely. I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. And and other people are going to see my addictive behaviors or manipulative behaviors or maladaptive behaviors quicker than I am. Mm -hmm. I might not see my irritability or all of a sudden I want this medication maybe more than I should or the irritability or the thought processes that are going through my head because I'm living it and I'm experiencing it that maybe I haven't had for months or even years or decades for people in recovery. Other people know when I'm like sober, they're going to notice a difference in me in an altered state quicker than I am and potentially getting how I think, how I feel, how I act and react is more addictive and maladaptive than I am because I'm in the middle of it. I've, mm -hmm. I've got tunnel horse vision, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So being able to tell people in your support network is so important because they're going to see the thoughts, emotions, behaviors in a way that from an outside party as opposed to me living it and experiencing it. Another thing I'd recommend, double, triple your meetings if you're, in a, if you're a meeting goer. What more time do you need the support than now, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's hugely important, hugely important. I had a client of mine that's drug of choice was alcohol. Never had a taste of desire to use opiates ever. He had a major knee surgery and he instantly had the strongest cravings in his sobriety for alcohol. So this is a different substance than his drug of choice. He never liked opiates when he was in active use, but because he had this mind altering, mood altering substance, he wanted to drink. So he told his, he told his wife that, please go get me alcohol. Please go get me booze. You know, he, this guy was in my relapse prevention group. And you know what his wife said? I will get you alcohol, but if you drink this alcohol, I am putting up the for sale sign. Wow. <laughs> but my point being, even though it's not your drug of choice, these are mind altering, mood altering chemicals. Mm. And sometimes it's the disease of addiction. And even though it might not be your drug of choice, he never liked it, but it changed his mood and it created a desire. And he, and he, and he said in the, in the relapse prevention group, when he came back from, from when he could crutch around, if I wasn't going to split open my knee, I would have crawled to that liquor store. That's how strong his craving was. Mm -hmm. So the, the need or the proactivity of having a support network is so important. One thing I'd recommend as we're talking about you can't avoid the pills that you're, these opiates that you're on, whether it's your drug of choice or not, give them to someone else. Hey, I appreciate your support. I don't want or need to trust myself and doling this out myself. It says every six hours, do you mind giving it to me when it's ready as opposed to me doing it myself? Because you're putting yourself in a position of taking more than prescribed. Here's another thing I say. We can be really... Um, manipulative, especially in active use and taking these pills for people can put them in a position. And some people say, I'll give them to my spouse or I'll give them to my parent. And then I do this, mommy, honey, please give me another one. Please just one more. I swear I'll just take one more. And we can manipulate out of fear and suffering. And sometimes our loved ones, whether it be our spouse or our parents will enable us. So sometimes I recommend, okay, who should you really be giving these medications to? Maybe it shouldn't be the people that you know that you used to manipulate or would manipulate moving forward. So maybe it can be a friend in sobriety. Maybe it can be a sponsor. Maybe it can be a next door neighbor. But if, if it's not healthy to be you, then don't do it. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really good message uh, that you're saying. Because um, essentially what we're saying is that for cravings, for addiction, you know, the solution is not to outbeat it, 
but to ask for help. Yeah. And I feel like that's a really good. And then if you can do it by yourself, that means, yeah, you're not an alcoholic or an addict. But yeah. like that's also one thing that's very touching and humbling about people in recovery, yeah. is that we're like I, we need help, yeah. and that's the only way I'll get through yeah. anything, you know. Yeah. And and that's it takes a lot of courage to admit that. Let's talk about non-opioid pain medications and other solutions because sometimes, whether it's the medical field, whether it's the marketing, whether it's the business behind um, these pain medications like it's the only way to go and we have to use it bullshit <laughs> here's some other examples so non-opioid pain relievers such as we know there's acetaminophen and tylenol and NSAIDs which is non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and Advil ibuprofen and believe it or not these can manage really mild or moderate pain <laughs> successfully when you are no longer addicted to pain pills and neurologically your pain receptors are like, oh, I need this as dependent on it. And after you go through that rebound effect and you're past that withdrawal stage, not for chronic pain clients at first, but for, for the majority of people, these things work very well if you don't use them regularly. Um, that's one thing, local anesthetics. So for certain procedures, Local anesthetics can be used to numb a specific area, reducing the need for systemic pain. So it can be beneficial for minor surgeries and procedures. It can be a local anesthetic. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Why would you need a narcotic when something like that can, can work for a vasectomy and other things uh, that need local anesthetics? Mm -hmm. uh, regional anesthesia, techniques such as nerve blocks or epidurals, can be employed to block pain signals to specific regions of the body. These approaches can provide really effective pain relief without systemic effects of opioids. It's regional. So mm. far, so good, right? Yeah. Physical therapy. Physical therapy can play a crucial role in managing pain and promoting recovery. It's, okay, here's the surgery, but sometimes the long-term beneficial effect is the action after the procedure because that can set up the conditions for healthy healing and recovery more so than just this, the surgery. Mm -hmm. It's hugely important. And what do people often slack on after <laughs> a surgery? It's, it's the physical therapy that can lead to long-term minimizing or reducing or getting rid of the pain even more so than the potential surgery. Mm -hmm. Non-pharmacological interventions, integrative therapies. What do we have here? We've got acupuncture, meditation. A lot of these things, chiropractic care, may offer relief from pain and discomfort. And there's a lot of research that says this is really beneficial for a lot of people. We've got episodes on classical Chinese medicine and acupuncture and chiropractor and all kinds of things that you can look at our episodes that, that highlight this for pain and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you know, everything that I'm hearing from this episode, as I'm listening, you know, without any clinical background, uh, the way I'm interpreting everything is pretty much the power of honesty, you know, the power of truth mm. and people respect that. And the universe respects that. Yeah. Like when you are in a situation, you mention everything about you, you know, that has happened. And then the solution comes, you know, there are just always ways to overcome anything. You know? yep. And I feel like everything that you have listed are all as a result of, I cannot do this, help me, you know, yeah. as opposed to, oh, let me just sneak this in, you know. <laughs> the the mind-body connection in these practices are so strong, especially when, just like we can manifest a craving and it can become even more intense when we obsess over it. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more about that in the next episode, the psychological. But man, things like mindfulness, meditation, yoga, relaxation techniques can really help manage the pain. For a lot of people, intense or chronic pain is like a trauma response. So the psychological and the belief of the pain can manifest and make the pain that much more worse. So things like CBT and thought stopping to reduce the stress is really important for a lot of people. 
a whole lot of people. Over-the-counter topical treatments, creams, patches, and gels containing ingredients like menthol, um, NSAIDs can be applied directly to the skin or the painful area for localized relief. I mean, it just keeps on going. But often we hear a lot of times the medical, our current medical model is, oh, here's a symptom. Oh, let me treat the symptom and get rid of it very quickly. As opposed to, here might be some healthier ways that can be just as effective, if not more effective, for pre or post, you know, op and and, uh, long-term relief. Man, how's that for the the physical piece? Very informational, very good stuff. So we're certainly talking about how we set ourselves up for, for cravings and potential relapse. And hopefully you guys are seeing... Uh, this will be part one of two part series when it comes to how we set ourselves up for cravings. Uh, and most importantly in the next, next episode, all right, we've got a full blown craving. How do we reduce it and get rid of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. On that note, one message that I want to end with, uh, from the point of view of life coaching and mindfulness coaching is that, uh, our minds are so powerful Mm -hmm. for either way. The thing about craving is that once I made a decision to get high, nothing can stop me. Like nothing can stop me. And same is true for recovery too. Yeah. That once I really want recovery and be sober, all these doors open up and then there is a way. That's that's my experience. Yeah. Love it. Well, thank you guys. We're going to give, a, give you guys a cliffhanger and then we're going to do part two of how we set ourselves up for cravings and how do we minimize and reduce the cravings after we potentially set ourselves up up for them. Whether we set ourselves up for them or not, how do we get rid of the craving or minimize it? All right. Please like, comment, subscribe. Appreciate you all for joining in and listening. And uh, my name is Luke. This is all. See you next week. See ya.